Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we explore the strengths we have because of our sensitivity and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there, to the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers. Today's episode is a little bit different, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about that, but how are y'all holding up? You should be hearing this, I'm thinking, sometime in December of 2020. We're coming to the end of this year that has really been a doozy, hasn't it? (laughs) I don't know about you all, and I know I say this every week, and my hope is that it's validating and not discouraging, but I just have people reaching out to me, therapists, and new clients that are just really struggling. It's been a really challenging year, and it's trauma. Everybody may not be traumatized, but it's trauma. I totally lost my shirt with my husband this morning, and it is really unusual that I lose it the way that I did. And we worked it through. We're fine. We're good. It's something that happens every once in a while. But I I just think that the pressure and the stress that's building up It's hard and it's getting to all of us. We can do hard things. We can get through it. I just always want to name that for y'all. So this episode is a little bit different. I, As you know, I've been on TikTok and there is a creator and his name is John the Blind Woodsman. He creates the most amazing stuff. He also cooks. He, He has a little segment called Cooking with the Lights Out. He is married to Annie, who's also an artist, and she has her work on TikTok. I just was incredibly drawn to wanting to get to know both of them. And so John came on the podcast. He and Annie are married. They're full-time artisans. They have a little dog, Pickle. It's really delightful. I do want to give you a little bit of a warning that he talks about how he lost his vision. We talked before we recorded and made it very light and very brief, but there is a mention of it was an attempted suicide. There are no specific details. It's something that we talk about very briefly. I I feel really mindful about knowing that many of you who listen are empaths. Many of you have your own trauma history, and I never intentionally want to activate anybody. But we also start out by showing that he's doing really well, and this was a part of his story. So I just want to let y'all know that. In this episode, he talks about what it's like to be in an interabled relationship because he relies on Annie for some things with her vision. He talks about how they met and what else? He's rebuilt pianos. He is a mechanic. He just is really good with his hands. And we talk about how his spatial relationships are really above average for somebody who is blind. I think it's a really interesting episode. We also talk about what are things that you shouldn't shouldn't say or do around somebody who's blind. And he talks about his experience. He talks briefly about how he cooks some of the accessibility tech that he uses. And I don't know, I think it's pretty interesting. It is a little bit different than our typical episodes, but it's been an untypical year. If you have not taken the podcast survey, you really can help me out if you go either to the show notes or to my website at unapologeticallysensitive.com. There's a tab that says survey. It will also sign you up for the newsletter. I am sending out a monthly newsletter just telling you what's going on if you want to know about what kind of offerings I have. I'm not sure where we'll be with the December groups that just meet once for $25 during the month of December. Not sure if they'll be sold out or over by the time you hear this. But if you are on the newsletter, then you have a link to that. There is information on my website. There's a tab that says holiday groups. So let me tell you about John. John Furness is a woodworker and is totally blind. The blueprints for any of his projects start forming as a picture held in his mind. Because he has previously had vision, it allows him to visualize the design and change it any way he needs until it feels right. In his own way, he still uses sight by forming a physical object that originated from an imagined diagram. The journey in his own woodshop has mirrored his journey through blindness. Each project has brought its own challenge, much like navigating the landscape of a sighted world without sight. He lives in the Pacific Northwest with his wife Annie and his fur kid Pickle. And I do ask him if he dreams in color. What do you think? Do you think he dreams in color? Anyways, now on to the show. 
Hey, John, welcome. Hello. I'm excited to talk to you today. I'm excited to be here to talk to you today, too. It's an honor. I really appreciate it. Oh, well, thanks. Well, I found you on TikTok, my new little obsession. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love your woodwork. Um, I love Annie, your wife's, uh, her her creativity. I'm not yeah. sure what to call it. And it's interesting that one of my sons was watching you before he knew that I was watching you. So we've also talked about how much we love the work that you do. And so oh, I cool. wanted to reach out to you and connect with you today. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and Annie, she's she's a painter and she's an artist of many stripes, actually. She was a professional photographer for a long time. She's done embroidery work and stuff. So she's and she does all of our social media. Like you, you wouldn't even know who I was without her. You, I mean, <laughs> I'd be sending out pictures of my nose hairs, maybe. <laughs> yep, yep. Her work is just amazing, too. Yeah, absolutely. In the show notes, there are going to be links to all of the social media that you gave me. And if Annie oh, gives yeah. me hers, too, I'm happy to include those because her work is beautiful. We're trying to get her on the podcast. No promises. We'll have to just wait and see on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She She's not feeling well today. Otherwise, she would have said hello, but she's not doing too good today. But oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. John, why don't you, well, we had talked a little bit about whether you identified as a highly sensitive person. And what you said is that you're highly empathic, but you didn't think you were highly sensitive until we talked a little bit about mm -hmm. it. What are your thoughts? I would say I am sensitive uh, in many ways. I mean, I, I definitely really feel other people's emotions a lot. I, I really try and put myself in their place to kind of see what they're to widen my perspective, so to speak. I've, I've been through some pretty interesting situations, mostly that I've put myself into, but it's given me a, a wider perspective on the world and a way to kind of get a little bit more insight into how things might be going, how somebody might be feeling. So I would say in in that way, I'm a sensitive person and I I try to consider mm -hmm. other people's feelings and situations and, and I really try to think through things. Sure. And part of what we talked about before we started recording, because I think the term highly sensitive person, people think of someone who's very emotional and can't regulate their emotions and cries a lot where it's really, it's it's a term that Dr. Elaine Aaron coined in the 90s, and we're deep thinkers, we process deeply, we have a sense of justice and fairness, we tend to be very loyal and conscientious, and we notice things that other people don't. We do have strong emotional responses to things. You put us in a good environment, we do better than a non-HSP. Mm -hmm. You put us in a lousy environment, we do worse than a non-HSP. So there's so much more, but the term just doesn't really adequately describe what it is. So I think people hear sensitive and nobody wants to be sensitive. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. It's there's meaning lost in words after time. And it's no fault to Dr. Aaron. So I don't mean to, you know, I, I was talking about this with another colleague that I don't know what, what you could call it. It is called sensory processing sensitivity, but even that, I don't know. Anyways, I would love to talk to you a little bit about your woodworking because it is just beautiful and amazing. Thank you. Uh, yeah, go ahead and ask anything you like. <laughs> How long have you been doing woodworking? Let's see here. 15 going on 16 years now. I learned at a place in Salt Lake City, Utah. At the time, I was living with my parents. Uh, this was back in, oh, what would it have been? 2004 five and six. And I had gone there. It's not a, an academic school, so to speak. It was more of a training center for blind people that are, are young people that are transitioning from home out to on their own. Uh, also adults that have become blind and are needing to learn those skills and also work with vocational rehab to try and get employment. They had uh, cooking and cleaning classes and Braille and things like that. And they also had a wood shop, which I thought was a little bonkers, honestly. But 
I've always really been adventurous and into creative things like that. So I decided to give it a try. And I I found I just really have a gift for it. I have a knack for it. And I think I'm better at woodworking than anything else I've ever tried, to tell the truth. Mm, you also cook, though. I do. Yes. I I love to bake and to barbecue. I actually do some segments on TikTok called cooking with the lights out. (laughs) I love that. I've seen a couple of them and it's just, yeah. yeah. So going back to the woodworking, Mm -hmm. you know, my family and I were talking about this. My kids were home. I've got kids that are in college and we were talking about this. I'm incredibly risk aversive in the thought of, for me, being sighted and using power tools around my hands, like "Mm, I'd probably lose a finger. So the thought of, you know, somebody who doesn't see using tools that could take away all of your appendages. Mm -hmm. Can we just talk about that? Yes. (laughs) Talk about that a little bit. I tell you, it, it keeps me safe, honestly, because I'm very keenly aware that I can get hurt real bad. To tell the truth, my brother actually cut off three fingers this last year and, and he's fully sighted and he just wasn't following the rules. That's really what it comes down to. And Mm -hmm. I've got a brother that uh, he was a surgical tech in Salt Lake City, Utah, at the University of Utah Medical Center. He said of all the fingers and everything he's reattached, he never had to do that to a blind person. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, And so I'm very, very careful. I follow all the safety rules. And maybe even go a a step further sometimes if I feel like I can't safely use a power tool to make a cut or do what I want, then I I use a hand tool. It takes a little more elbow grease, takes a little more time, but you still get the job done. Sure. And for the listener, if you're interested on John's TikToks, I haven't seen any of your other social media, but it shows you actually working with wood using power tools. I don't have the language, so... No, that's correct. Yeah, power tools. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, there's a video on the adaptive measuring tool that I use, that we made. And uh, that one is important because that is the only adaptive tool in my whole shop. That's... Wow. The, the main difference between sighted and blind woodworkers is the way that we measure. With that that device... I am actually able to measure more accurately than I ever could when I could see. And it's so simple too. Basically, it amounts to a finely machined bolt with a wide nut on it. And that's it. Easy. No, mm. it, it's so simple. But in that, it's that's kind of its beauty too. It's a durable thing because it's just a bolt. If I drop it, I doesn't really matter or anything. So, and it's extremely accurate. It, I love it. And you work with wood that, that are different colors. We were talking before we started recording with yeah. some wood that is just beautiful and amazing. Can you talk a little bit about how you work with different colors if you're not able to see what the colors are and how just, I, I want to, I really want to get into your story, but I just would love to have a brief yeah. overview of yeah. how you, How do you work not being able to see what you're working with? Well, Annie helps me out with that, my wife. She'll help me separate the different colors. You know, if I'm going to be working with a new wood that I'm not familiar with, she will describe the different colors to me and things like that. But I know that Paduk, for instance, which is a nice wood that ranges all the way from a deep maroon to a light orange, that's one of my favorites to work with. Uh, another one. Me too. <laughs> yeah, it's good stuff. It, and it, it machines nicely too. It doesn't just look nice. It's nice to work with. There's another wood called Yellow Heart. That's one of my favorites. That What I have now is the last that I will ever be able to get my hands on because all of the uh, responsibly harvestable groves of Yellow Heart have been played out. So you can't get it anymore legally anyway. And I am definitely not going to, you know, I don't want to contribute to deforestation. I like the nice wood, but I'm not going to get it at a cost like that. So I, I'm going to make something real fancy with that, real special with that. When I'm using the different colors for different layers, I, I do like to do some fairly complex designs. 
So sometimes what I'll do is I'll use a marking tool and I'll put grooves on the, the sides of the boards on each, say, yellow heart board. And then I know the, the boards without marks will be the Paduke boards. Or sometimes I'll arrange it in even like a grid pattern. And so I'll have to mark which piece of wood is going to be on the end of that particular segment and and so on and so forth. Yeah, your work is beautiful. So I really would encourage everybody to just go take a look because it's amazing and gorgeous and just beautiful. I, I want to segue just a little bit. Mm-hmm. I want to talk about how you became blind, but I want to before we go there, like I want the readers to kind of, not the readers, I would like the listeners to know, like, you're married, you are, you have a dog, you are living a happy life, you're managing very well, that you've really made this amazing adaptation. So for anybody that's like, ooh, I don't know about the story, like, we want you to know it worked out fine in the end. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is there anything you want to add to that before we talk a little bit about how you lost your vision? Well, I do everything I want to do. I've even learned how to rebuild pianos and did that as a business for a couple of years. So I've definitely come a long way. And the way I became blind was part of that journey. Mm -hmm. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Can you bring us back to what was going on at that time? Yeah, well, it happened when I was 16 years old. Leading up to that, I had really started to be depressed, really kind of built up big emotions inside my own head that really, a lot of times just weren't there, stories I told myself that just weren't true. And I never really reached out to anybody about it. And finally, I tried to, I attempted suicide. And When I did that, it took my sense of sight and also my sense of smell. Luckily, it left my mind completely intact. I I had no brain damage of any kind, and I was able to adapt to becoming blind so well and so quickly that I really now believe I'm supposed to be blind. That's something that for one reason or another, it just had to be. I mean, I I truly feel like I was born when I became blind. I just am a completely different person. And I'm a person that I really like, too. And to give you an example of how quickly I adapted, I've always been into mechanics. And a month after I got out of the hospital, I replaced the rear wheel bearings on my old car all by myself. Wow. I I actually taught my friend Carlos how to do the job in the process. Hmm. How was the transition? Because for anybody that's, you Mm -hmm. know, been in that place where whether you had an active plan or not, I've had this thought before, like, my fear is if I ever tried to kill myself, Mm -hmm. that I would end up disabled. Yeah. That to me feels like, "Mm, not like things aren't good now. That's just a risk. So imagining that you think you're going to end your life and then you wake up and you've got, you've lost your vision, you lost your sense of smell. How was it coming back from that? That was pretty tough. I remember, I mean, I had this, I guess I had this attitude after that, that, you know, I was still there and I had to keep going and I was lucky to be, to still have my mind, to still Mm -hmm be able to function fully. I mean, my body still worked just fine and everything is just my, my eyes and my sense of smell. And Mm -hmm. because I was a teenager, I wanted to be normal as normal as I possibly could. And so I, I really just kind of put my all towards it, but also I, I really did adapt quickly. It really, I have such a visual imagination that it's, I like to say it's like I have a computer design program in my mind. I can see an image right in front of me that I create. I experienced something called a condition called Charles Bonnet syndrome. And it's something that uh, people that have had sight and then become blind, it happens to them. And it's not very well understood. 
it's a visual hallucination and it's it is considered a hallucin- hallucination but it doesn't have any auditory aspect to it or anything like that and apparently it can be very disturbing for a lot of people like the images are unpleasant to a lot of people but to me personally it's just colors and shapes and i've been able to make that the background so call it like the wallpaper and then uh, i can put any image i want mm. over the top of that uh, that's how i design my projects and how i do those kind of things i see a finished product before the wood has even touched the saw i was wondering about that yeah so i i'm able to change the colors the layers the shape anything i want Just like computer design programs I've seen when I did have vision. Mm -hmm. So it really, I feel very, very lucky and blessed that that's, you know, that I'm able to do that. And at first it was hard to deal with because I can't get away from it. There's no, there's no closing my eyes or anything. The only way to get away from it is to sleep that was a big issue. And, and I still have really bad insomnia, but that has to do with not having a day night light cycle and not so much anymore with the, the visual part of it. Mm -hmm. And it only, that actually took uh, about a year to fully develop. It started out as just uh, kind of random pictures and shapes and things, but I was still able to, to just picture where I was very well. I My spatial awareness skills are far and above what most blind people are. And, and I've had several mobility specialists and other blind uh, teaching professionals uh, tell me that. So it, that's another reason why I really feel I, I was supposed to be blind. So for people that don't understand what that means to have really acute spatial awareness... Can you explain a little bit about what that looks like for somebody that's not familiar with those terms? Okay. So for instance, when you can't see taking something like say 60 square feet, you can't take 60 square feet and put it in a context where a blind person can feel it in its entirety all at the same time. Not the same way that you can look at that 60 square feet and know what it is all in its entirety right at the same time. So it's kind of hard for a lot of blind people to extend their perception out that far. So that actually is very detrimental in uh, navigation, for instance. If you know that you need to go 150 feet in one direction and then you have to turn and go x amount of feet in another direction it might be very hard for them to estimate when they've gone that far because in their world it's just just step after step it's not seeing that i'm going from this point to this point but there are the ways that blind people use to navigate in that way they'll have landmarks that they go to like for instance there will be a particular bush that sticks out that they know after that bush, they need to go to the the next corner and take a right. Or they'll count from there and they'll know that the third sidewalk is the, the uh, business or the house that they're going to. So spatial awareness allows me to use my hearing and my imagination to be able to know those things and guesstimate that kind of stuff. To tell the truth, I I even really enjoy target shooting and I'm pretty decent at it too. It, that has been a really big benefit to me wow. too because that extends not just from navigation but down to the fine minute details that I have to use when I'm woodworking or or measuring those kind of things. Sure. When you dream, do you dream in color? I do. Yeah. I basically just dream the way that I experience the world now, you know. Mm -hmm. And do you have any vision at all or what is it like from your from your perspective? 
there's no, I have no vision whatsoever. My optic nerves were completely destroyed. Okay. Um, and, but to me, it's not just black. Like I said, I have the colors and shapes that are there all the time. And I basically just kind of automatically imagine my surroundings and so that's always mm-hmm. kind of there. And the what I actually see is the background, what I called the wallpaper, basically, is mostly red with black kind of speckles, like static on a TV screen. That's uh, And it doesn't move quite as fast, and it's not quite as random. And then there's like patches of blue that kind of move in and out right in my central kind of for, you know, field of view and then uh, some stars and squares and, and things like that. And that all just kind of moves in and out and around in a kind of a kaleidoscopic way. And then what I want to imagine, I can picture over the top of that. Hmm. Interesting. So, what, yeah. what does it mean to be in an interabled relationship? What is an interabled relationship? I, for instance, am totally blind and my wife is not. Or, you know, if someone was an amputee or confined to a wheelchair or any, a disability and being with someone that does not also have a disability. It takes a bit more patience, definitely. Like I've broken a whole cabinet's worth of dishes since Annie and I have been together you know, spilled gallons of this or that or the other thing. It definitely takes a little bit more patience on her end. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, and there was a bit of adjusting too when we first got together and that kind of thing. And I, I rely on her a lot more. I depend on her a lot more than someone might in your, your average equally abled relationship, so to speak. Because I, you know, transportation, um, reading mail, for instance, there are certain things that I simply cannot do, even though I am a very able blind person, there are certain times that I simply just need help. So she, I rely on her a lot to do that, but we, we make a wonderful team, you know, and we realize that it's always an adventure. (laughs) I love it. I I mean, I've seen glimpses. I mean, nobody knows what goes on behind closed doors, but it seems like you two have a really good working relationship. And it requires patience on both sides, that when you need something and you have to wait for her to be able to help you with what you need, I mean, it it really does go both ways. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. We've both done a lot of growing in our relationship. We've helped each other grow and we've just, it's been really quite the journey. I live in Washington state and I moved up here to learn how to rebuild pianos because as a blind person that has almost zero computer skills, but I'm good with my hands. I, I, I'm good with mechanical things. I'm uh, you know, I'm a woodworker. I am just good mechanically. And to find a job as a blind person in that kind of a field is almost impossible. Because it, you know, it's a, a great risk to the employer. And and I understand that. I get it. Also, I uh, got into some trouble when I was in my early 20s. And mm-hmm. that gave me a criminal record that really also was a problem getting employment. It basically, as a blind guy with uh, no computer skills and uh, criminal record, it basically no one would even give me the time of day. It, not even for something like bagging groceries or anything like that. So I'd really been having a hard time finding any kind of employment at all. And what I'd actually really been spending my time doing, I was living with my folks in Salt Lake and the uh, woodshop teacher of the school retired mm-hmm. while I was going there. He and I had started to become friends so he invited me to come and work in his wood shop with him and learn more. So for the next couple of years, I basically refined my fine woodworking skills. Then when when it just got to where I, I you know, I needed to move on, I wanted to find something to do and somewhere to go with my life. 
And his father-in-law, who was also blind, went to the uh, school I came up to here in Washington. Uh, it, it's called the Emil Fries School of Piano Technology for the Blind. And it unfortunately had to close down a couple of years ago because it they didn't really have the funding anymore. That was why I moved up here, because working on pianos is really fine-tuned woodworking for the most part. It, other Outside of tuning, really, that's what uh, repairing and rebuilding a piano is. And I have to admit, uh, I was never the greatest tuner, but I was good at rebuilding them. And so I, I came up here and was accepted to the school and everything. And the second year of school, I met Annie there, my wonderful wife. And mm. she, uh, so she was painting a piano for a fundraiser that they did every year. Um, and she happened to be painting a piano in the same workroom that I was uh, repairing a piano. And so I I walk in there, and this was actually in the summer break, but I uh, the school taught mainly tuning and basic repair. And I was actually learning total rebuilds, like new strings, new hammers, everything. And so I was attending some extra courses. So I came in, and uh, she's painting her piano, of course, like an iron bar to a magnet. I put my hand in the wet paint on her piano. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, luckily, she was just priming it. I, I thought I had just, like, put my finger up Mona Lisa's nose or something like that, mm. you know. <laughs> but and we both kind of laughed and apologized to each other. And uh, uh, we got talking more and more. And oh, it was a few weeks later, she called and asked me out. <laughs> and... Mm-hmm. I, uh, I, I told her I'd have to call her back. I was busy. And what it really was is I was broke <laughs> and mm. not a single penny. So I didn't know what to do, but I had a big garden patch with a huge patch of peas and they needed to be harvested. And from what I knew of her at that point, I knew she would love that. So I called her back and asked her and she went with me to the garden and we picked peas until sunset. And uh, we ended up getting married in that same place three years later. Wow. And how long have you two been married? We've been married for five years. Wow. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. And it's, it's been wonderful. I, I rebuilt pianos for two years. I got out of that because Mm -hmm. I loved learning about it. It was so interesting and cool because it's geometry and physics and all that stuff. But the problem I ran into is after you learn everything, every piano is the same 10 to 11,000 parts. So it was so repetitive. And I'm a, I'm a creative person. I like to, you know, obviously I'm an artist, so I like things to change and be new and different. And that would have just, like I said, been the same thing over and over again. Plus a lot of the work required me to kind of hold my arms out in front of me and do adjustments Mm -hmm. for several hours during the day. And I've injured my back severely a few times in my life. I've broken my back three different times, Mm. totaling five crushed vertebrae. So holding my arms out like that all day was just cripplingly painful. So I I stopped doing that and and it was kind of hard to get business too. Rebuilding a piano is like getting a car sure. rebuilt. It's several thousand dollars. So I I got out of that. For a while I didn't quite know what to do. In uh, 2016 I I got out of piano work in about oh what was it about 2015 or so. And in 2016 Annie bought me a wood lathe for my birthday. And the lathe has always been my favorite. And basically a wood lathe, think of it like a potter's wheel for wood. And instead of using your Mm. fingers, you use chisels. I started making some things. I, the first bowl I ever made, I ended up getting complacent and I put my finger where it shouldn't have been. And I got injured Mm -hmm. pretty bad. 11 stitches and eight weeks to heal up. 
left a trail of blood like a wounded cowboy in a John Wayne movie all the way to the back door. But I learned a valuable lesson. Don't put your finger there, you idiot. <laughs> so I, I started making a few things. Annie's mom asked me to make her like a little dresser top jewelry dish. So I made her just a nice, simple little jewelry dish with kind of a nice design on the edge. And Annie posted a picture of it on Facebook. And within about a day, there were about 14 or 15 people that said, hey, I want one. I want to buy one. And that's how I started to be a professional woodworker. (laughs) Wow. Wow. With her getting me out there on social media and stuff like that. And I can't say how you know how much she does for us like with all the social media stuff and that kind of thing no one would even know who I was because I don't know how to do TikTok or Facebook or any of that kind of stuff and she is a very talented artist herself we're so Mm -hmm. blessed because we're able to do what we love for a living we're both professional full-time artists and it just it feels so wonderful to be able to, well, to be able to support ourselves. Honestly, you know, not being able to find employment and being blind for most of my life, I thought I would always have to rely on public assistance. Mm-hmm. I thought that I would never be able to not have to rely on social security and things like that. And it feels so good to be able to, to, to do that and, you know, to be able to support ourselves and and do something that we love to do at the same time. I, I'm very proud of that. And it's because of, you know, like the, the wonderful people too. I mean, without all the people that support us and, and just are, are out there just doing their thing and being wonderful, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. Yeah. So I have to say thank you to them too. Yeah. John, I want to switch gears a little bit. Can you help the listeners understand that they haven't been around people that are blind? What are some common things that you think people should know? Maybe common things that people say or do that are not helpful. Just can you share a little bit and help people understand? One thing that I think a lot of people assume that a blind person needs help. You know, like if they see them walking, a lot of people will just start shouting directions. Mm -hmm. I think I'll be walking up to a gas station or something like that. And I mean, I don't personally think I look lost. I'm just going down the sidewalk. But people just start shouting out, you know, keep going and then turn right. And that's very distracting. Yeah. and, And not helpful at all, honestly. Observe the situation a little more. See if they go in a circle or, you know, like there are signs that that are obvious that someone is lost. And also ask if they need help. Don't just start shouting directions and assume that they need help. Mm -hmm. Say, hey, do you, you know, do you need help? Also, uh, when you're speaking to a blind person, don't look at the person that they're with. Look at them. Speak to them. Don't talk to the person that's with them Mm -hmm. because you're not talking to that person. You're talking to the other. You're talking to the person that's blind. Let's see here. Don't just grab a blind person and pull them along. That is very rude and not helpful. Um, Those are the people that I like to call them the, I'm going to make you let me help you. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, when you are guiding a blind person, you let them take your arm, not the other way around. Mm-hmm. Because if if you take their arm, you, they are leading you, not the other way around. Mm-hmm. So uh, those are a few things. Also, being blind can be very lonely because I can be in a crowd of a thousand people, but none of those people will reach out to me to just say, hi, how's it going? My name is so-and-so, what's yours? It's always either no contact whatsoever or the assumption that I'm lost. Mm. That can be very, very lonely and very discouraging too. So, you know, maybe instead of, 
you know, even asking them if they're lost, just say, hi, how's it going? My name is so-and-so. What's your name? And there's been many times that I've even been, you know, say at a, at a party with friends and I was still alone, even though I was in a crowd because there, you know, the music was loud or just nobody really reached out to me. So that can be very lonely and disabled people. We're just people, you know, Mm -hmm. we just go through the world in a different way. Sure. Sure. Those are some great, great hints. I feel like I'm all over the place, but that's just how how I, my brain works. So you said you lost your sense of smell. Do you have a sense of taste? I do. I'm very lucky that I still have a a pretty decent sense of taste. Okay. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what it's like for you when you bake. Are your recipes in Braille? Actually, no, because I, I can't really read Braille. I know Braille, the characters, but I have such thick calluses on my fingers, I can't actually feel the Braille. I hadn't thought about that. That's fascinating. Yeah. yeah I uh, I mean, I have calluses where I could put out a cigarette with my fingertips. Wow. I, uh, so I, I can't really feel Braille very well. I Like I said, I know the characters, but what I do use is my smartphone, my iPhone. Best thing for blind people since Braille was invented. I mean, even better, honestly, because, uh, I mean, I've got apps that I can uh, use to read my money for me. I, I, I've i got all the video services, Netflix, Hulu, Prime, all that stuff I can access through my phone, uh, Library of Congress, audiobooks, and then I can do just a search to for anything I want, you know, a voice search even. And it's... It, The iPhone and the speech software on it have opened my world up completely because the speech software programs that are on desktop computers are very clunky. They're very complex, and I just really had a hard time learning them. But the iPhone is so perfectly mated to its speech software that I just... I never could have imagined something could be so user-friendly and useful. Well, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. If you go into your accessibility, you can change it so that your phone will read the text that's on your phone. And if images have a description, it will also describe them to you. Is that correct? Yeah, it's called voiceover. Okay. Yeah, I, I actually have encouraged some people to close their eyes and give it a try just for fun. And one thing is, if you try to use voiceover and use your vision at the same time, it will almost always mess you up. Like uh, in a, there's almost been never that I've gone into a Verizon store, store, for instance, that a sighted person was able to effectively use voiceover. Oh, like for instance, the way that it works your your finger is basically your mouse cursor. Now you touch the screen and uh, that highlights the icon. So think of that like putting your cursor on whatever icon that is. Then you double tap the screen just the same way that you would double click a mouse button. Problem is you tell people they have to double tap on something instead of touching it once first to highlight it, they just double tap on it. Problem is... When you double tap the screen, you activate whatever was last highlighted, not the area that you've just double tapped. Mm. So they'll activate things that they didn't want to activate and they don't know how to to not do that. And so it's if you it's made for somebody that's blind. And if you don't use it like someone that's blind, it'll mess you up. Sure. (laughs) Do you ever use the app Be My Eyes? I never have before, but I I do have it. I uh, I've done FaceTime calls with my family and stuff to do the same kind of thing. But mm-hmm. uh, I do have uh, video games uh, designed for the blind. So how did this work? Well, there's a a driving one that's really fun. You put on headphones and uh, there's music that plays, and you you hold your your iPhone sideways. And there's music and and you have to center the sound of the music in the headphones. And that tells you you're in the middle of the road. Interesting. 
And then there's other, like there'll be a cow that you have to steer around or a prize that you have to run over and things like that. There's also uh, card games that are a lot of fun. There's a uh, space invaders. There's one that's basically, uh, Oh, it's called breakout. So it's like one person ping pong hmm. and, uh, it's it, there's a lot of really fun stuff on there and just i really it, like i said i had no idea how much it would open my world until i got one yeah i think technology is just really booming i, I want to drop back if anybody doesn't know what be my eyes is anybody can join the app you can download it and if there's somebody who's blind who needs help with something they put out a call and you get a ring on your phone and you can answer it and it connects with video so I've helped before somebody was taking their blood pressure and needed to see what their numbers oh. were. Somebody had a receipt and they needed to see where it was from and what the date was. So there are all different types of ways that you can reach out. And you know, if you if you want to be an extra set of eyes for somebody that needs it, it's kind of cool. There's another app I have called Tap Tap C. And what that one does, I... Uh, Say I want to know what's in a can. I can take a picture of that can. It goes on the internet. I find what it is and then tells me. I love that. Yeah. Sometimes I have to take a couple of pictures before it gets it right, but it usually does. Yeah. With the woman I was helping with her blood pressure, because I couldn't tell which way was left or right based on what her mm -hmm. phone was doing, trying to get her to get the camera where I could see it. And the same thing with the receipt. You know, I'm yeah. I'm in my 50s and I didn't have my glasses on. So, you know. <laughs> so it was kind of helping each to, other. You had to put your eyes on before you could be somebody else's eyes. Kind of, yeah, yeah. John, we're needing to wrap up. Is there anything that we mm -hmm. haven't touched upon that's feeling important for you to talk about before we wrap up? Well, I guess one thing that's really important for me to talk about would be suicide is stigmatized. It's treated like a, a shameful thing that needs to be hidden. And it's something that shouldn't be seen as a shameful thing. It shouldn't be stigmatized. It needs to be out in the open because when it's out in the open, you can get help. You can, you can find ways to get around it instead of either dying or being disabled or, oh, you know, like I said, it's it needs to be turned into something that that needs to be helped and not something that needs to be hidden. Yeah, I agree. I think mental health and especially this year with COVID is yeah. as a therapist, I'm just seeing people are really suffering and struggling. And right now we're recording this in the early part of December 2020. Personally, I'm struggling. The therapist friends that I have are struggling. My clients are struggling. Yeah. You know, I share that because I want to normalize and validate that we have been under unprecedented trauma for yeah. a good seven, eight months without an end in sight for a number of reasons, just the pandemic mm -hmm. alone with without all of the other nonsense that we've been dealing with. It's taking yeah. a toll on our mental health and there is not even enough support for people that need it. And our frontline healthcare workers are under mm -hmm. tremendous stress. And when is it going to be okay that we struggle and we can talk about it and it's okay to get help and, and there's not a negative stigma around it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I even had my struggles with substance abuse in the past mm -hmm. and that, you know, like I, I was able to overcome that through the help of my friends and family and my own determination. That's, that's something that you can do too. Yeah. I think for many people, I mean, there's definitely a biochemical aspect. There are family oh, yeah. things, heredity. And Absolutely. what my experience is, is if we are not honored as children, that we don't have parents, adults, caregivers who really love and embrace who we are and how we show up in the world, we learn that who we are is not okay. And so we find other ways to manage that are not authentic. And that can be with substances or exercise or perfectionism or workaholism. I mean, there's mm -hmm. all kinds of ways that we learn to manage because that precious little child spirit that we're born with is not honored. And so when we take away the stigma, it's just about really going back in and doing that healing work that we need to and finding ways to go within and, and really do the healing and the loving and the nurturing that we all should have gotten. I mean, that's an oversimplification. And so there's obviously a lot more to that, but in 
in 20 seconds. That's the best I can do. It's a good way to put it, though. Yeah. Yeah. John, where can people find you if they want to know more about you? I, I will put all of your links in the show notes. Uh, you can find me if you put in The Blind Woodsman. Uh, I'll come right up or uh, theblindwoodsman.com. Also, uh, Furnace Studios. That's F U R N I S S Studios. So, so there's three S's in the middle there. Dot com. And uh, that'll get you to my Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, all that stuff. Yeah. And it's, I really would encourage anybody that's curious and wants to know a little bit more about John and Annie. I happen to just be a fan of TikTok because it's, you know, up to a minute. So it it satisfies my need for lots of novel stimulation. Mm -hmm. But you can see John and Annie's work. You can see John cooking. You can see John and Annie's dog. It, It just, you're really delightful. And I'm so glad we got a chance to talk today. Thank you. Me too. Anything else before we say goodbye? One, one quote that I love uh, from Martin Luther King. If you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. And with me, if you can't see, imagine. There's always another way to do something. You just got to think about it. I love that. That's beautiful. That's thank just you. beautiful. John, thank you so much for being here with me today. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. And thank you, too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Hey again. So I'm curious to know what you thought about that. Was that interesting? Are you interested in learning about people with different disabilities? I don't know. I find it fascinating. I, I don't know if you all know, I worked as a sign language interpreter uh, as a previous career. I worked for the community colleges. I worked for the school district. I did community and medical interpreting because we were out of, at that time, it was called Disabled Student Services. We work with a lot of different varieties of students. And I don't know, for some reason, I'm just always really interested and fascinated and want to provide education. If you haven't taken a look at John's social media, I would really encourage you to do it. It just, it's really delightful. And the stuff that he does is just amazing. And Annie's work is just beautiful as well. If you've been thinking about taking the online HSP course, this has been a tough year. Don't know how you're doing. I am running a group right now and this group was so cohesive. I can't promise how your group is going to be they decided to extend for an extra month in December. And some of the things that I'm seeing going on with the intimacy and the vulnerability in this group, it, it's it's just beautiful. So not only do you get to learn about boundaries and perfectionism and mindfulness and self-compassion and turning the negatives into positives, there's more. But this sense of being with other people that are wired like you, and when we have a group of people that is really able to be vulnerable. And I'll I'll tell you, part of this intimacy is, I don't want to overshare, somebody had some shame and some gremlins come up and did not communicate and was not present in a group, but it impacted the rest of us. And we talked about how this impacted us because I think in our lives, we often have loss and we never learn how to talk about it. And as a result, We shared communication with the group about what that was like to not have this communication for a very important group. And as a result, there was so much open sharing. There was a lot of shame that was involved, and that's why there was lack of communication. And the connection that I saw form because of this honest, open, heartfelt communication that was safe and appropriate and boundaried, it it is just really amazing and powerful. The things that I've seen in some groups that's been over a year now are still communicating. I I really think that not only do we need to know about the trait and the strengths and really understand and, and to really start to internalize what we're thinking and feeling and needing and knowing that we have a right to do that, we've got to have a sense of community. We've got to have at least one other person who really understands and gets us. It's great when you have a therapist at does that. I think that's really, really important if you have a therapist or a coach that understands the trait. But having peers that share that experience and can really mirror in a loving, compassionate, safe way. And I'll, I'll tell y'all, I'm really, I, I really have done, I feel like this sounds conceited, 
but uh, we just did uh, the closure for the last group, even though we're continuing. The feedback that I got from the group is, it is such a safe place. And because I personally share the things that I'm struggling with, I model the depth of sharing that people can share if they want to. Y'all don't have to. Everybody gets to choose. But because it's done so mindfully with very clear boundaries and with people that I screen ahead of time, so the sharing is very appropriate, it's very warm, it's very nurturing, this stuff can really be life-changing if you haven't experienced it before, you've only had it in pockets. And I don't know about y'all, but even some of my therapist friends are struggling and some of the relationships that I have with some of my therapist friends are strained right now because this is just a hard time. And I think that we do better than the non-HSP in positive environments. And this really can be such a beautiful place to create connections, to learn about yourself, to tune in and to have that sense of community. And I think people are just longing for authenticity and vulnerability. That is my pitch for the online HSP course. You can find links in the show notes or at my website. There's a tab that says HSP groups page. Registration is open now. I don't know how quickly they'll fill up. I do cap them at eight because I want them to be small and intimate. I want everybody to have a chance to share at every group. If they choose to, you don't have to. So that's my pitch. As we slide into the end of the year, provided you hear this in December, I hope that you are doing well. This year probably looks different than other years. There's some loss. There's some joy. It's a mixed bag. I'm here. If there's anything you need, if there's any way that I can support you, please let me know. 2021 has got to be better, right? (laughs) It's got to be better. Please know that I am here. I appreciate each and every one of you. Remember, sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. It's our superpower. Have a blessed day. 